Um, welcome to the fifth CTO Roundtable session um, organized by the Software House. Um, today we're going to discuss a topic that's on many development leaders' uh, minds. Uh, how do we handle the fast-changing pace of development languages, um, frameworks, environments, how to prevent and fix legacy code whilst your business is running or might be even grow significantly fast. Um, I forgot to share my screen and I'll do that now. So we have a great panel um, today. Um, we have Peter van Dijk. Peter is the um, manager product development and innovation at Go Connected. And Peter is from the Netherlands. Welcome, Peter. Um, and from Finland, uh, Juha Pekka Leine. Juha Pekka is the vice president of technology at Midaxo. And we agree that I can call you JP. So uh, <laughs> welcome, JP. Um, and um, Remco Jorna, uh, the CTO of Fintech OS. And Remco is also from the Netherlands. Welcome, Remco. So uh, my name is Gerrit Oude Veldhuis. I'm the CTO of Travelia and the general manager of the software house in the Netherlands. So um, I'll stop here so that you can see uh, the panel a little bit better. So JP, uh, can I start with you? So can you explain in a few sentences what Midaxo does and what your role is within the company? Sure, thanks. Yeah, Midaxo is a SaaS company offering a product for mergers and acquisitions and, and the corporate development. It's founded in 2011 and it's a, it's a Finnish company. And uh, we have a niche market, so we are targeting on, on large corporates, mainly in the United States. And many of them are in, in Fortune 500. And uh, of course, we have very high security requirements because of the very confidential data in, in the tool and so on. We have offices in, in Helsinki, Boston and Amsterdam. And uh, our, our R&D is mainly in Europe. So uh, I'm running the Helsinki office and I'm the vice president of technology and um, leading the engineering development, maintenance, security and, and technical support. Okay. Okay, very good. Thank you. And uh, Peter, can you give us a short introduction about yourself and the company you work for? Yeah, I'm working for, yeah, my name is Peter van Dijk. I'm working for Go Connected. We are from, uh, based in uh, the Netherlands. We are, uh, yeah, what you can say, a fast growing company uh, in a uh, growing in an organic way, but also by uh, taking over uh, companies, add ons. And uh, we are mainly focused on the cables and ducts uh, uh, industry. It's also partially in this market. And a lot of our uh, products are uh, GIS based. Yeah. And recently, and I, and you recently acquired a company of uh, 200 people. So uh, this topic is uh, very uh, current, I would say. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. And Remco, uh, same question to you. A few cents about uh, Fintech OS and your role, please. Perfect. Thank you so much. Now, so Fintech OS is a company that provides a low-code, no-code platform for financial services companies. Um, so they can effectively, effectively build their native digital journeys. Um, it can sit on top of existing systems or sometimes replace some of the systems in the ecosystem. Um, Fintech OS is a company that started three years ago. We are headquartered in London with an office in Amsterdam and our main development center is in Bucharest, Romania. Um, so these times with COVID are very challenging um, for getting, uh, keeping the company together, but very fun as well. Uh, our solution can be delivered as a managed services platform or installed on premises in a customer environment. Okay, very good, thank you. So um, many pe people think that the issue with the legacy uh, systems, legacy code, as we call it, uh, is just technical. And it's actually a significant people issue uh, too, as many developers don't even want to touch um, legacy code. And from a procedural side, security might be at stake or scalability might be an issue. 
Um, developers, especially younger developers, uh, want to work on the latest and greatest technology always. And uh, we have a client, as an example, um, that has solution based on WordPress. Their business is running you know, like crazy, really good. Um, the environment works really well for them, but they are struggling to find good developers. And the minute they talk about their tech stack, developers lose interest. Um, as a result, we are helping them now to develop everything using new technologies from scratch and replacing the uh, WordPress environment completely. Um, you might even find yourself in a position that you're not able to acquire new customers because of the legacy system. There are many sides to this. And um, um, I, I might think that there, there are some of the people, hey, hmm, am I in the right meeting here? Um, I work for this startup and everything is new. Uh, we don't have any legacy code or legacy systems. Um, I would say that, especially with startups, the legacy code issue might become very large very quickly. Um, development is done fast. Uh, speed is more important than future-proof decisions sometimes. And um, who doesn't know the situation that the proof of concept uh, became the actual product or it wasn't meant to be, but it became it. Then, um, you know, you have the frameworks. New languages are getting popular fast and new technology comes around the corner. This is especially the case in front end these days. Um, uh, imagine you developed um, something using AngularJS and then had to switch to Angular and now to React. Well, maybe, or we saw in our recent um, state of the front end uh, survey, uh, which was answered by 4,500 developers, that Angular is losing interest from developers very fast. So, you know, everyone has to do with this uh, legacy code uh, situation. So, I would, I would like to switch to the panel now, enough uh, listening to me, I would say. Um, so, Remco, can you uh, can you start? Can you provide an overview of your team setup and some specific issues you faced uh, regarding to managing legacy code? Yeah, of course. Um, so fintech OS is a uh, a local no code platform, um, and we also deliver some business accelerators on top of it that are built with this low code no code platform. So actually, we have different teams um, working on the core platform. They are really the let's say the native hardcore developers who work with the, the frameworks and they need to make sure that the, the software composition, the external frameworks that we use are kept uh, up to date, that they are still compliant and everything else. And they have to make sure that whatever is built into the low code platform um, doesn't break the existing solutions that are built using this low code. Um, so we have another team as well. Uh, these guys uh, and, and ladies, they build the accelerators, they use the local platform. So any of the issues are surfaced very quickly. If there are breaking changes, they are. And it also means that if we start um, optimizing or refactoring or changing parts of the core platform, there's always this double check to see what the potential impact would be on the, um, uh, on the existing solutions, because we know how they are built. We're also in a bit of a lucky situation um, because many of the, the real technology is abstracted from our customers. So they, they will work with a more abstraction layer in building their solutions where under the hood, we can do some technology optimizations. Okay, yeah, yeah. So you're using your own technology. Uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, so JP, um, can you explain your team setup? You said a little bit about it already, but uh, and some issues that you ran into with uh, with regards to legacy code. Yeah, sure. So have a team of twenty professionals. There are many many developers, and uh, of course we are working now remotely whole team. But uh, in we have a, most of them are in Finland. Then we have well, in, in Latvia, UK, Ukraine as well. And, uh, and uh, we are switching the new architecture and, and technology stack. So we have one third of the team is actually newcomers who don't have the understanding of, of our current uh, core product, but others have been working on, on the current product that we have uh, for a while. And, uh, and, and uh, the product has been developed with Microsoft technologies during the past 
eight or nine, nine years. And of course, it has evolved quite much during that time. And, uh, and uh, we are maintaining our current product and uh, doing small development on it. And of course, making sure it's secure and so on. So uh, we are in, in a good position that we have the professionals here who know the code base but uh, still everyone is involved actually with the new development also. So we are rotating people who maintain the current and then uh, uh, and uh, work also in the, in the new one. And they, they work in parallel, you said. So, um... Yeah, and we have parallel streams. So four streams in parallel are, are developing new features. Okay. And um, yeah, of course, what we have faced with, with our product, because we are switching to new technology, is, is of course that it's complex code base that is very difficult to understand. And uh, there's been many developers throughout the years. So it, it's difficult to maintain, difficult to develop, and, and also the developers understand it. So so means that development is quite slow. It's laborers to test. And of course, the releases are, are slow because we need to anyway make sure it's secure and, and high quality what we do. But it now takes more effort from us. And uh, of course, there is a regression box and, and the hidden dependencies and some undocumented and hidden features that come sometimes as a surprise for us. But, uh, but anyway, those are very known issues and then we have identified and developers have identified those. Okay, okay. So you have a strategy of uh, developing new in parallel with maintaining the old and rotating the developers uh, in and out. Okay, interesting setup. Um, Peter, um, can you um, explain a little bit about how your team is set up and how you're managing the legacy code? Now, there are different teams to which I'm steering and guiding from my role as product owner, product manager. And uh, but one team in particular is working on a product which is more based on legacy code, and this team is built up from uh, that's uh, about six seven full stack developers back end front end. Uh, QAs are involved and uh, and some support engineers, but uh, this team is also fully supported. What we uh, what we see as uh, really needed, for example, is a business analyst because specific issues we have to deal over there is the fact that we are sometimes not fully aware why some functionality is there. And also then it's hard to work on legacy code. That's something that, and that's also the bridge to what you were referring before with uh, startups. Yeah. Uh, please pay attention to from day one uh, of describing why functionality is there because uh, sometimes it's forget, uh, people forget it and they don't want to invest in it, but you will that the day comes that you need to pay back, and that's uh, that would. Uh, and now you need to, at later stage, you need to figure out why it's there. That's uh, that's and that's I really see. expensive because you don't want to make mistakes, and and with that, uh, cause issues for a client that you're not aware of. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. and that yeah. will take take lots of times. Yeah. So. Okay. So one um, housekeeping um, uh, mentioning so. I mean, this session is for, for, for you, for the viewers of the round table. So you should make sure that you get the most out of this session. And these people love to get um, questions from you. So please feel, uh, uh, put your questions in the, um, in the questions tab and I will discuss, discuss them with the panel. Um, so far, no questions yet, but that will, uh, that will come. Um, if, we, uh, if we can't address all the questions uh, because of time or whatever, then we'll uh, contact you later with, uh, about that. So, okay, so good. Um, so Peter, um, can I ask you, so do you think there's, there's a silver bullet that, um, or one best practice that you, that you can execute for uh, preventing or managing or um, legacy code? How do you see that? Yeah, legacy code, I think it, it comes in or, yeah. Um, because it, for example, when it's not scalable or not stable and that, that kind of things, then it, then it will be, uh, comes under your attention. And uh, an important lesson what I've learned from the past is that um, 
people think immediately of, for example, rebuilding something. That's the first reaction. And uh, I've experienced in the past that it was went very well. Then it was very clear also for us what we need to rebuild. Yeah. And then we could speed up and we didn't have, uh, in parallel, we built from scratch something completely new using the newest technologies. But uh, now, now I, for a while, I have to deal with a different situation. And then it's much more important, for example, that you exactly, well, once again, what I've already explained, what do you need to, or what are you building or what are you improving? So I have always a focus on the functional part and then later on, on the technical part. That's, uh, and in parallel, you can already start with uh, measuring your code quality, all those kinds of things. There are all kinds of tools yeah. for this. Yeah. And then, and, and based on this, you can make also, uh, you know, what what I what I would advise sometimes is also freeze everything and spend some time. It can be, uh, for example, a month or a couple of months on analyzing things, analyzing the business, analyzing the code, and make proper uh, decisions on this. That's yeah. uh, no, very good. And, and JP, you you were saying also in, in our, when we discussed before that um, um, you're actually developing in, in parallel, um, but re reshaping also what, what is the focus of the, of the product or, or what functionality are you going to provide? Is that correct? Uh, um, or what workflows are you going to support? Yeah, e exactly. And the strategy that we have chosen, of course, depends on, on the business goals and also the state of the current code base and, and the developer resources that we have. And uh, we have chosen the strategy that best suits for it. Uh, what Peter mentioned, the understanding the, the features that's being built and why they are there, uh, that's sometimes challenging and uh, we have accepted it that uh, we might not know all the details that we have in our current product or how, how our uh, users are using it. They have very innovative ways to use it because it's, it's a very flexible pl platform. Uh, for this reason, if we would just uh, build a, or create like a technical rewrite, we would have ended up by duplicating the features as it is if we targeted our existing customers. So we actually chose the strategy to uh, introduce new platform gradually uh, so that we will target the new, new customers. So slightly different customer segment, and then we will start extending the features so that eventually it will have the same features as the current, but they are improved, uh, better processes, and uh, it, it, it requires that the customers change their way of working also, which yeah. means that we actually sell the new product to the customers so we don't force them to migrate. Because we, this is the only way we can really uh, build new innovations to the tool. So that otherwise the existing customers would be guiding us to create the clone, uh, which is not as valuable. Uh, but eventually we will bring the features there. Uh, also, we have a hybrid strategy because this way, I suppose, it takes time to build a replacement. So we are introducing features to our current products also uh, with the micro-fronted approach. So we will uh, develop new features with the new, new, new technology and integrate those as, as a micro front to our current product. And it's possible because we have, have the knowledge in-house and we maintain the code. And uh, so that way uh, we keep everyone quite happy. And of course we have the budget to do, do this, so two different products, which, which is good. And uh, of course, would like to hi highlight here the reason for uh, or uh, why code is, is legacy. What is the reason for starting the rebuilding or, or refactoring? Is it, is it a business decision or, or, or a technical decision? But in a sense, if you don't have the legacy code, means that you haven't learned anything or your business doesn't evolve, so. Yeah. Okay, very good, interesting expression there. So, um, Remco, so any specific strategy you 
um, followed um, with regards to legacy code and maintaining or getting rid of it? Yeah, I, I very much concur with what Peter said about uh, analyzing, determining the impact, spending enough time in understanding what it means to change some of the legacy code. Yeah. And on top of that, it's an, that wasn't addressed so far. Um, we put a lot of effort into what we call software composition analysis. And that's actually the usage of external frameworks that you can get as uh, NuGet packages or whatever that you use inside your code base. And that have a significant amount of dependencies on other packages. And these dependencies could be very, very well hidden. Um, so in our uh, CI CD pipelines, we employed a lot of uh, a lot of tooling for for software quality, for uh, detection of dead code, um, but also a tool like uh, like White Source that gives us a um, continuous feedback on the type of external libraries that we're using, um, about the vulnerabilities in those libraries, and about what our platform actually looks like. And for us, that has been a a very big focus um, in, in parts of replacing or solving legacy code uh, problems um, and moving to different libraries. And especially when we are currently in the move from um, like .NET to .NET Core, uh, which is quite a big exercise, um, this dependency on external frameworks becomes uh, very visible yeah. and might even harm you in the speed that you, that you want to develop. Um, so that's, that's effort in, uh, in that space. Uh, we use a lot of additional tools in our CI CD pipeline to get insights in um, what we actually have as code. And we do a lot of instrumentation in, as part of our running platform um, to understand which parts of the system are being hit um, by, uh, by code that was, or by the low code parts that are done by our customers to also assess the impact. If something is rarely used, um, or we see different usage patterns, uh, we, we could have a different strategy of solving it. Yeah. Uh, so instrumentation, um, tooling is really helpful in, uh, in, in managing the challenge. Yeah, no, very helpful, thank you. And so there are several uh, products and you were saying you were using white? Uh, we use white source, but there are, there are other companies that provide similar type of, uh, of solutions. Yeah, okay, very good. So, um, you already addressed it a little bit, JP, and uh, I think uh, the chase, what we call the chasing the rabbit problem. Eh? So you have uh, you have the old system, and um, but it needs an update because of business pressure, and and um, whilst you develop the new solution. So how do you handle that, especially because you have two parallel teams, and the old team of the old system is still getting better, whilst you're trying to catch up with a new system. How do you handle that? Yeah, that is a, it, it, it is a tricky issue often, and uh, and we have analyzed that well, of course, before we started any, a project or so. And as, as mentioned, we have we have um, dedicated resources for for our current core product, and uh, and we have budgeted those also so that uh, new development actually focus on, on initially on on attracting new customers. And uh, this, what happens to our existing customers and with our current product is, is actually this maintenance operational cost. So uh, introducing the improvements, that's what we do all the time. So we have uh, dedicated resources that do full-time improvements and maintain the code base, uh, update packages and so on. And uh, then of course we need to, for the new features, we need to balance all the time and we need to estimate how much it benefits our customers that are our existing customers and how valuable the feature is to them. If, it, uh, more, if it's more to the, some new potential prospect, we might introduce that feature in, in a new product. So that's how we balance it, it all the time. And, uh, and uh, like I said, our current corporate has all the bells and whistles in it. So. It's, it's very comprehensive, so the improvements are mainly actually usability related and the scalability uh, and uh, not that much need on, on the new features, totally new features, but we have introduced those also. Okay. So case by case, uh, 
the new development and then small improvements all the time with, with the dedicated resources. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, and, and Peter, I noted that uh, um, uh, not the current uh, project you were, or product you were talking about, but the previous product that you've been working on, you, you did a rebuild from scratch. And um, dear, um, you, I, I, I mean, you, you will see situations that the old product still has more features than a new product and people don't want to switch, etc. Any tactics that you applied back then to, to make people switch? Yeah, that was from day one. You need to be, and it, of course, you need to be, uh, needs to be approved also by the business. But uh, from day one, my advice would always be to be transparent and that you do only fixes in your old solution. You freeze this, only fixes, only what is really needed. And uh, make it clear, announce it, make it clear to all stakeholders, repeat it over and over again. The same story. That's yeah. the thing, and uh, and that you put the most effort in the new solution. And uh, and at the beginning, you should get your internal stakeholders on board, your sales, support, consultancy. Everyone should be on board, and uh, so that they spread the same words to the external stakeholders. If you are not doing this, what I compare it and I explain it always. Otherwise, you are studying history. You are not thinking about the future, but you are only taking a look at the history. That's not what you need to do. That would be really my advice. And, and the business will always say, no, but we cannot announce this. If you do it in a, in, a, in, a, in a proper and clever way, then you can do it. You can always explain. You need, it's not no, it's a no with a reason. Yeah, a lot of communication, communication I understand, yeah. Okay, yeah. good to hear. And um, Aranko, from the um, people side, so people that have developed the solution that uh, might be very protective. Um, they might have tried to improve situation in the past themselves, and now you come in and you know we'll we'll fix this, and we know we will come with this new solution. You know, how any tips on how do you take the developers and uh, I guess what you said, Peter, also um, the rest of the organization on your journey, uh, Remco? Yeah, yeah. So, um, like you said, the people part is probably the most challenging um, because you have to deal with emotions, with ownership, with this um, belief that something was built um, was the best thing ever. And actually it was because at the time it was built, it did meet a um, very specific business scenario. So there's nothing wrong with the code. The, the, the issue is or the challenge is that the world moves on and new capabilities or new requirements are put in. Um, so what we do is we really try to understand why certain things have been built in the past and the, the reasons for choosing a certain implementation architecture or certain libraries, whatever, and be very respectful to the people who, who did it. Um, we also have them think about these changing requirements from technology or business and coming up with, with suggestions, with solutions. And we actually ask them to spend time on being on staying current with technology, technology updates and what's happening in the, in the market. So we have a, I'd say no blame culture. You know, all the decisions were made in the past, not by a single person, but probably by a group of people. They did it with the knowledge they had back then. And they delivered something that was immediately valuable. Yeah. It's just that the world changes, so we need to start, we need to keep uh, keep improving. Um, so we actually allow people to spend time in, let's say, R and D type of tasks, trying out new things, seeing how it would fit into the into the platform, and come up with suggestions on on how to migrate. Okay, very good. That's um, uh, it. It is indeed the most difficult thing, and you know. Uh, it's, it's, I, I like what you're saying, the fact that the decision was taken years ago and it was the right decision then because the business group, otherwise you wouldn't be in the situation that you're in, that you want to grow on. Yeah, yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so there's a theory that you have a um, certain group of developers that are more focused on new development and certain group of developers they are they're more focused on existing maintaining existing code do you do you support that theory um, jp 
or uh, do you see that different? Um, I, I see it almost like that. So, uh, and I would actually add a third category in, in there because, and I think it's, it's quite easy to identify this. So there are developers who are not interested in understanding, understanding existing code or someone else's work. That's it like. Mm -hmm. not interested on that, want to build something new from scratch. And, uh, and then there are, and uh, then actually move forward. And uh, then there are developers who are interested in starting a new own project and continue working on it. These are usually the in-house software developers, but they are still not interested on, on uh, understanding what's been done. And then the third group is, is really interested on taking over existing solutions and starting starting to improve those so of course then you can categorize that some of these people are actually working for for software consulting houses or and and uh, part of them in-house development teams but they e there is very easy to identify this because people often tell them tell it like immediately when you start discussing about yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I often start my recruitment discussion with, with this, that telling our existing solutions and, uh, and some, some details about it and ask uh, and see, see how the candidate, for example, reacts on if he is interested on, on it or not at all. At all. And, uh, and uh, I think people know it very well themselves also. Yeah. And um, putting the wrong person in the wrong position is, you know, that doesn't work. I, uh, I, I agree. Yeah. Interesting. So Peter, um, from, from a, you, you have, I think you have got a lot of experience here from a, um, um, cost point of view. And so, um, some, sometimes if you, you know, get a new product or, or a, you know, after acquisition, you get a product and you need to, um, uh, rebuild, refactor, or improve, or whatever, it can be very costly. So um, you you will have to convince management how you know to support that and put money towards upgrading, rebuild, refactor, rather than new features, etc. So how do you do that? And what what has worked for you in the past? Uh, yeah, different different things, but. Uh, where I also start focusing on, even with new uh, features, uh -huh. is also bringing it back to, to the business. Sometimes asking also, say, okay, come up with your business case. That's also for new features, but also improving something. If the, the business case, yeah, the, the revenues you will get out of this are uh, determining your options uh, with how to improve it. There is a one, you know, more or less a one-on-one -on -one relation, and that's sometimes forgotten. They ask me how much it will cost to build this. I said, yeah, it's depending also sometimes on uh, what you ex exactly want, want to get out of this, or what you can get out of this. That's uh, and uh, then people start thinking in a different way. You will get them on board. That is, uh, I always compare this also with sailing. Yeah. You need to get them on your on the boat and uh, also with legacy code and also with improving things. Sometimes you are in a rough sea, yeah? And you need to get them on the boat. And when it's you are in a more calm sea, then you take a look back and, and say, okay, how can we avoid this rough sea? Let's explain it. And okay. then business people much more understand also, they said, okay, but you need to invest a little bit more in this, for example, improving existing things instead of extending it with new features. That's that's how I approach it. Okay, okay, very good. Um, interesting. So the questions from the audience, um, and we get many, so I'll have to pick some. Um, I, I think this, this one applies especially to you, uh, Renko, because it's related to a bank. <laughs> um, so what are the challenge we are facing as a startup is integrating with the new technology um, integrating with new technology with legacy systems such as banks, business to business. What's your advice in such a case, uh, Remco? Uh, that's a, that's new technology a, connecting with old legacy, etc. Yeah, so it's, that's a very good question because if you look at our platform, we are we play in an in an ecosystem. So we don't go into a bank, at least not a tier one or two a tier two banks. 
um, that are greenfield. You know, there are always, uh, always existing systems. Um, so what we did in our platform, we created some, uh, let's say, out of the box technologies for linking into some of the existing systems. We actually work with some of the providers to create those interfaces. Mm -hmm. But we're also very clear, there are some type of things that our platform cannot do, um, but you need to deliver it as a separate project inside your bank. So if we need to connect into a mainframe based system that has no, um, no APIs attached to it, um, our platform which uh, could run inside your organization or on cloud, cannot solve that problem. We cannot connect into your MQ series environment. Um, so for these cases, we would usually work with a, uh, a more SI that takes care of opening up those systems or getting the data out or whatever needs to be done. So it can be consumed by, by our platform and used in different ways. And it's a bit of the, of the bigger topic on uh, how to move your organization away from a, an application a siloed approach into a more data centric approach, which is, uh, I used to work for a fairly large insurance company uh, before joining FinTech OS. Uh, it's not an easy challenge. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think especially in the, the whole FinTech world, this is, this is a, a huge challenge with, with, with a lot of legacy, important legacy systems with, that's going around, where a lot of money is going around, et cetera, and then yeah. connecting to that, yeah. That's right, and you have to respect those systems. They deliver the value for, uh, for the business, so you can't just take them out. Uh, but you, what you do need in your organization or in your teams are people who understand what this landscape of a bank or insurance company looks like. Um, so they can actually have an intelligent conversation with the client to, to figure out the best way to approach it. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so, Another question uh, or, or more re uh, remark from Catherine is, um, um, it might be interesting to define what's legacy code and what's technical debt. And um, so to make sure that uh, we understand the, uh, the difference here. So uh, JP, and the, uh, any definition you could share? Yeah, um, well, technical debt is, is really something that is mainly known by the developers and then they have often even a plan plan to catch it up and uh, and it's it's a part of the active active code base when uh, again the legacy code as such is is something that doesn't bring business well it can bring business value but but you, the team is not interested on developing it any further so so the team is moving forward i wouldn't say that even even a code that is um, is doesn't have a business interest would be a legacy. Only only when the developers lo lose the interest or you lose the developers, then it becomes a legacy, and uh, someone else has done it. You don't want to touch it, and you have no interest on it. Yeah. But as long as it's like warm, meaning someone is maintaining, modifying it, it it's it's still really up to date. And uh, and then you have the technical depth there and. Uh, you might have the plan to get those fixed and you can yeah. be able then communicate that to business also and try to get the budget for fixing those. But suddenly if you have too much technical debt and you don't get the, the budget or, or resources to fix those, then it might actually come to legacy quite, of, quite quickly. It's about having the resource available, the knowledge available of the business side or the technical side or both uh, even worse. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, because of time, I'm moving on. Otherwise, I'm. Uh, but at the end, we will have another uh, another run at uh, the questions from the audience. So, um, so if you if you you talked about it, Peter, uh, a little bit. So creating a plan, a roadmap that you share with. Uh, uh, with people to get them on board, as you call them, you know, in the boat. Um, but also, if you know, developers, product owners, of course, clients, uh, etc. Show them, I call it always, show them the light at the end of the tunnel. And um, can you share some experience that worked well um, creating such a plan? Peter? Yeah, uh, yeah. Of course, always is it's about a, a roadmap. Yeah, and uh, what I see already uh, with my experience is that 
what is maybe the most challenging thing when it comes to roadmap is also what it means for example a roadmap that's uh, because sometimes people are mixing a roadmap with very detailed when a such a such a feature becomes available and so on it's more guiding everyone uh yeah you're showing your plans for the longer uh period and uh and you should also have it not only a uh, functional roadmap yeah but also a technical roadmap and uh and have different uh yeah views on this uh for example when it's more becomes you can have functional uh, wrote something functional in your roadmap and uh, if you have a technical part for this then it also you will uh, get for example developers on board because then things come in view which sounds interesting to them those kinds of things so that you and uh, yeah, that's my experience with it make it that everyone uh, understands it in his uh, way and also uh, with his uh, taking his DNA in co into consideration. Did you so? Did you develop in um, several plans, or is that one plan with different angles, or how do you how do you see that? You can you can do it with different approaches, but uh, it all begins with your roadmap, which is functional. Because yeah, yeah that that's sometimes also what you have is uh, we have all kinds of buzzwords. So <laughs> our managers or directors wants to use. For example, blockchain, yeah? But why are you using blockchain or one other buzzword or something like that? The, the business reason for it, and then it for sure, at some point it becomes also technical. And I may have very, what you I think all uh, can see, what I'm sharing is I'm very business driven. And then at, uh, sooner or later it becomes technical. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good, thank you. So as I said before, uh, some people might think that this is not be a problem. Um, we don't have legacy code. We didn't run into the Angular or Python replacement uh, issue, or um, we have a stable front end. I'm very curious from the, how the audience sees this. So uh, I'm going to share again. So um, I would like to start a poll. Have you experienced any legacy code issues at your company? And um, three options here. I'm going to pick one and uh, submit. Let's see. Um, give it a few seconds. Okay. Can we get the results? Let's see. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> this is uh, this is very clear. Okay. So I, I, I thought I might need to convince some people, but no, we're, we're convinced. Or maybe we're convinced and that's why we're visiting this, uh, this session. But uh, any response to this, uh, JP, Remco, Peter? Uh, how do you see this? Oh. Curious about the people who said no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I've never had problems. Well, I, I guess that's someone that just started, or I don't know. We'll see. No, well, that might have a very good could be start new new projects every time and then move forward. Then you oh. might not have that issue. You you are you may avoid the legacy code issue that way, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, for that short contribution. And this is uh, this was uh, not surprising, but uh, but good to see. Um, so, Remco, um, how flexible are you towards your development teams? Um, uh, how do you handle you know choices of framework, languages, legacy code uh, um, fixes, etc.? Who decides on that? Is that is that central? Is it you or is it? Um, um, the developers themselves. How do you how do you work with your teams on that? Yeah, it's it's uh, very much uh, put into the teams, into the DevOps teams that we use to come up with uh, with ideas or, or proposals um, when it comes to uh, like adopting certain uh, certain technologies as part of our platform. Um, so we allow them to to select the frameworks, and uh, of course there's a due diligence part. You can select a framework, uh, but it has to fit in the current technology. It has to be 
maintained well. There has to be a living community around it. It has to be secure. So there are many aspects um, that we will check. Uh, but we allow them uh, to have a lot of freedom in, in coming up with suggestions and doing some experimentation. Mm -hmm. um, now, since our platform runs inside uh, banks and insurance companies as well, we need to take care of the proper licenses, um, especially when selecting uh, third-party components. We don't have a lot of problems with the code that we develop ourselves, um, but there are always challenges if you adopt software that was built by a community. Uh, many developers, especially the younger ones, they assume that it's been thoroughly tested, it's secure, it's compliant, and it has the right licenses attached to it, and in reality, it's not. At least not always, let's put it like that. Okay. Another element that we consider is if we move into certain, uh, certain solutions, uh, can we actually get the people who know how to work with this technology. If it's a little bit niche, we might have problems in getting the right people in our organization or the organizations that we work for might have an opinion on the type of, uh, of solutions that we are using. So we talk a lot to our customers. We talk a lot to the technology, technical community to figure out what are the choices. Uh, and our developers do that by themselves because they know if they come with a proposal that didn't go through the, the basic checks, um, it's a bit of a useless conversation to have. Um, yeah. so they know. Okay, but you leave it to them, so that's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I'm not that smart to know everything. You know, it's, the... it's you're as smart as a team around you. That's right. Okay, very good. So, um, so something I would like to hear from all three of you is, is um, so is is. How do you see this legacy code thing? Is, is that a something you just have to deal with or is it more a taboo that, that um, you don't talk about, uh, you know, because uh, um, maybe I've, I've failed because I, you know, have a lot of legacy code. So how do, how do, you, how do you see that? Uh, can I start with you, Peter? Yeah, I think you, you can uh, ignore it, but you must not ignore it. You know, that's uh, the thing. You, for sure, you will, uh, you will, everyone discovers it when you have it, everyone in the chain. So then it's always better to be transparent, at least internally, that you have it. Yeah. And then also, once again, get them on board to talk about it and the reason why. And, and then you can make proper decisions of why uh, you need to do something about it. Uh, to improve it or, or ignore it even. Sometimes it, the outcome can be also, be, okay, we can ignore it. This part, we can ignore it because it's something we will get some revenues out of it for the incoming year, but, and we can deal with this and afterwards it will be gone, something like that. No. That's, that's the, but don't be afraid to share it. That is. Uh, and, and, and Rempo, how do you see that? Is, uh, is it uh, a taboo in, in, in our world or is it something you can be transparent about? Yeah, I think the, using the word legacy um, could trigger some of the wrong emotions. So yeah. we tend to talk about existing code, um, which is just what you have in your system. Um, and you always need to think about improving refactoring. And in our company, we take the approach to do this as a continuous improvement cycle instead of saving it up uh, until one big release, because then probably it will never happen. And you have to, um, you have this big pile of work that's not getting any smaller. Uh, so we just embed it in every, uh, every sprint. Um, we work on refactoring, on re-engineering, on improving. Um, so it's just a part of normal life. Okay. Um, instead of a, of a big topic that grows to be bigger every time. Yeah, yeah, very good. And um, JP? Yeah. It, do you see it as a taboo or do, do you feel people see it as a taboo? I, I, I don't think, think so. For example, in, in our case, of course, it's not that that old that we wouldn't have the developers in there. So it, it's a the, all the time discussion about the code lifetime and the feature lifetime and, uh, and uh, how, how long the features will be there. And uh, also we are quite aware of our code quality. We have all, uh, tool, tools to analyze that uh, as well. And also the developers have very well, very good understanding of, of the technical depth and, and so on. But then of course, if you 
let the situation be bad for a long, long time, then you don't have any resources to maintain the code, which means that if it's like really, really old technology, and then of course it might be a difficult topic to discuss that, okay, how did you actually uh, ended up in that situation? But as long as you, you maintain and improve it gradually, it's not a big issue. It's, it's a, like I mentioned in the beginning, there are good stories stories behind the code as well as how, how it ended up into that situation, how, how some features were built. So those are quite interesting topics also among the developers at least. And, uh, and uh, that knowledge needs to be taken into account in future development as well. It, it's, it's really important to do that. And yeah. uh, of course, we already know when we develop something new, we cannot predict anything and that we don't know what is the uh, top technologies in, in five years or so. So I think we need to just admit whatever we do now, it's going to be more or less legacy after five years or so. Uh, so we have tackled this by actually switching to micro front ends and, and uh, microservices so that at least it would be easier than to rewrite these parts or build the new one from modules. Okay. Okay. So, it, and, and Remco, you addressed it already a little bit. So, theory uh, says that you, you know, you constantly needs to improve and uh, improve and prevent issues down the road. And um, uh, I, I wouldn't it be great if you could do an intense uh, workout for a month and never have to uh, worry about that anymore? I would like that. <laughs> um, uh, we see things like refactor Mondays. Um, or um, a strategy that when you change a piece, piece of code that you have to make sure that the whole um, and, you know, uh, function or whatever that you have worked on is cleaner after the, the change, etc. cetera. Um, do you have a percentage of development time that you spent on legacy code removal or is it more project-based or any special things you're organizing around that? Uh, I think if, if I would look at the numbers, but actually I didn't. I think we spent around 10% of the time in a sprint on um, refactoring um, existing code. Okay. Um, it's also because we we have instrumented the application a lot. So we have a, a huge flow of statistics around which parts of the code are efficient or need improvement depending on, on scaling out, etc. cetera. Um, and we have this unique situation where we sometimes deploy in a client environment and sometimes they use our managed services environment, yeah. which is a, a cloud-based um, uh, cloud operations. Um, and some of the things that we wouldn't see in a, in a customer environment, we do see in a cloud environment. So we feed in um, those analytics into the development team. And that's usually the trigger for, for looking at certain parts of the code. And as I said, the other part is that um, we have the, we have this system that just tells us um, if you have uh, some known vulnerabilities in um, in software that you use or download it, um, your solution just won't build. Yeah. Um, so then you have to fix it. There's no way of getting around it. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And so. I've worked for a uh, for a company and we had a project moving from 32 to 64 bits, and uh, that was a huge undertaking. Um, and um, this uh, specific company couldn't almost release uh, um, you know new features for uh, for a year because of this undertaking. Do we see cloud as the new 64 bits? So you can do a simple lift and shift, but if you want to really use the cloud, it's it's more than a simple um, lift and shift, of course. So do you do we see the cloud or another major thing coming towards to us to that's like the next 34 or oh, 32 to 64 bits? You have? Can you? Yeah. Uh, I see similarities on, on, uh, on the transition to the cloud, but of course, I would say that actually the transition to cloud is, is much bigger because um, the 64 bits was well, well defined. So now we have multiple cloud providers and, and they improve their solutions all the time and introduce new features and uh, 
actually kill old old ones. So uh, choosing the correct tools is, is difficult, and and uh, you need to have a really skilled people to utilize the cloud solutions in the, in the best way, uh, which means that actually you might need a couple iterations to be like fully cloud native. Uh, good thing is that you can take the cloud into use gradually and uh, yeah, you can also bring the old tools there and then extend those with, with the cloud technologies. But it's a, it's a major change and of course, it's driven by the need for scalability that the new user in the rest faces, single page applications and uh, having the mobile devices and so bring, so you need the horizontal scalability for, for that as well. Yeah. And it's, it needs to be in the server side. And Peter, do you see another uh, move coming towards us or is cloud uh, and big enough to uh, to focus on for a few years. <laughs> I think that yeah, that's that's big enough to focus on. Uh, there can be only yeah, what you uh, what you can see right now. There can be disruptive things that you couldn't imagine about, let's say one and a half year ago. Uh, for example, COVID nineteen is uh, forcing is forcing companies to move to the cloud, and that's also affecting. Uh, the, the, the performance of, of the cloud, even. Uh, and we don't know about other disruptive things, what can, uh, yeah. you know, but what I see with the cloud is the thing what is becoming even more important. Uh, in the past, there was always your, 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 your solution can exist for, let's say, seven years. And then you need to rebuild it from scratch, yeah. yeah. And now we have, an, I think, a, a much uh, a different uh, approach. Uh, is the thing is that the cloud is constantly improving with new uh, features and so on, which you can use. And you should pay attention on uh, adapting your uh, solution to this, using it and extending uh, the life cycle of your uh, solution. That are the big advantages of it. And that is also how you need to sell it to your uh, business people, that it is why you are, why it's needed. That's uh, why you need to do some extra maintenance, for example. That's uh... yeah, yeah. Interesting. I, I forgot about that, but indeed, I learned that school seven years. <laughs> seven yeah. years. Then you rebuilt it. Yeah, that's the, the world changed a little bit. Okay. So um, before we go to the questions of the audience, it's it's you know two minutes to go. Um, I would like to talk about um, the CTO roundtable session for one minute. Uh, we are organizing them every month and rotate the panel uh, on the topic. You can see uh, every month uh, other panelists. Um, what topic do you want to see? So put it in the chat window, put it in the question window, send me an email, um, favorite at th.io. Um, you know, if you want to be on the panel or if you see a certain topic, uh, I would be interested to hear that. Okay, so let's go to the questions and answers. Um, so I've got from Greg, um, and I'm, you know, to any three of you. So if you if you uh, want to answer it, uh, raise your hand. I would say any metrics you could suggest to help identify apps, features, domains that have to be refactored or replaced before making the decision of rewriting, refactoring a big piece of code. So do you have any any um, metrics that you could uh, suggest that you're looking at perhaps? Anyone? Yeah, as I said, we, we look into uh, which parts of the system are mostly used and are most likely to, uh, to stay there for a longer time. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's what... Yeah, we, we look into usage statistics. Okay, okay, yeah, interesting. Yeah, mm, we have a similar approach because this is really a tool for users, so how, how it serves them and how it adds values to our users. Uh, we need to analyze how different features are used and how responsive the features are, for example, and, uh, and uh, 
fr from there we can make the decision if we should improve something or, or not and uh, and really the the other aspect is is the speed of development and ease, ease of development so when there is a feature request or improvement request coming in and uh, we estimate how long it takes to do that or how risky it is and uh, if there are some parts of the, of the software that are highlighted that as a difficult ones uh, of course they go to the roadmap hey this is something that should be refactored so it uh, for, for the business it's easy to communicate that okay any change on this part of, of the tool takes very long uh, to do and uh, requires resources so then often you will get the permission to do something for it oh man um, we have <laughs> Other questions, but it's it's past uh, top of the hour already. So um, um, thank you, Peter, for uh, for joining us today, and um, JP, thank you for your uh, input and Remco. Uh, also, thank you for uh, for your support here and insights. Um, all very valuable, and I uh, I think it was an interesting discussion. I found it interesting. When time goes faster than you think, then it's interesting. So it's flew. The time flew away for me. Um, can't give you a fiscal gift, but in your inbox, you uh, should have received a uh, virtual uh, gift. I hope you enjoy it. And thanks uh, for your support. Um, with this, we're ending the uh, CTO Roundtable session and hope to see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye.